Thank you so much, and, and thanks um, to Marianne and Jasmine for the uh, invitation. It's, it's interesting, I've, I've spoken, I mean, probably hundreds of times about food and agriculture in a wide variety of settings, but I've actually never given a talk about um, veganism. This is, this is really a first for me, so I, I truly appreciate the, um, the opportunity. And I should also say, I think I'm, I'm much better uh, on this topic on paper than I am in person, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, the um, thing I want to talk about today is, is really, I guess what I'm talking about as I was taking the train in today, I was thinking I'm really going to talk about you know, what I believe about veganism. I'm in no position to speak for, for vegans as a whole, I don't think. But I do have some pretty strong ideas personally about um, veganism, and in particular, um, vegan education. So, in some ways, what I'm what I'm doing today is a little bit experimental, and I'm really interested in your input. There, there really is no such thing as cruelty-free meat, and uh, there re you really cannot be a uh, an ethical carnivore. And and let me give some background uh, to this. There have been, I mean, really for the last 30 years, there have been these really remarkable exposés of factory farming. And they have somehow, I mean, really quite remarkably reached a mainstream audience. And, you know, from Peter Singer all the way to Michael Pollan and, and Mark Bittman today, you have these um, I think quite heroic uh, exposés of, of the evils of factory farming. And, um, you know, mainstream conscientious consumers are aware of that and know that this is, um, these are products that, for, for moral reasons, we should, we should avoid. And that's really tremendous if you think about that. And it's happened in a relatively short period of time. A major accomplishment. But now that we're at the crossroads, now that a significant number of conscientious consumers are aware that factory farmed meat is a major problem. We are faced with a decision and I think that one decision, to me the obvious decision, to me the, the, the morally superior decision, is to just avoid these products altogether. Avoid meat and meat based products, animal and animal based products altogether. And this is where I think vegans have an important role. I think this is the message we have to promote, but we have lost. We've sat at that crossroads and really lost because the message that has been embraced by the vast majority of people who have said, yes, I will never support factory farming. The message that has been embraced is one of, well, I can be, I can be a, a conscientious carnivore. And if I spend a little more money and I find um, you know, a smaller farm where the animals ra are raised under different conditions, well, then I am okay. Then that is, that is an acceptable decision. So we've reached this crossroads, and I think we're on a path um, back to where we started. And, and let me explain why, I think, by embracing alternatives, you know, free-range this or, or cage-free that. Um, I, look, I'm well aware that, that for the animal in that situation, it is, it is a different experience, a more pleasurable experience before they die. But that's where my problem comes is we're still in this situation where we're raising an animal, okay? In these alternative systems, we're raising an animal, albeit under different conditions, sometimes nominal, sometimes real, real different conditions. But at the end of the day, we're still killing that animal to fulfill um, our taste for food that we do not, that we do not need. And so I think what, what is happening is you take factory farming and say, you know, what is the core? What is, what, is the, what is the very core thing that must happen for factory farming to survive? People have to eat meat. And then you take these alternatives and you get through all the improvements and at the end of the day, you're still killing animals for people to eat. So what's ultimately, ultimately legitimated from the consumer's perspective is it is okay for me to eat meat. I very much believe that as long as we live in a society that does think it's okay to eat animals and animal-based products, we're always going to have factory farming. Because you are, if, you, if you look at factory farming and ask, what's the one thing I can do to really take it down? It's to stop eating meat. But these alternative systems aren't taking on that one thing that you can do. They aren't educating us that that's the one thing that we as consumers can do to really take factory farming down. Instead, they're saying, look, here are these alternatives. 
But when I break it down, fundamentally, fundamentally at the end of the day, they really are no different. So how, how ha to me it's a paradox. To me it's a paradox that you can have humanely raised meat, that you can be an ethical carnivore. Um, it's something I have a very hard time getting my mind around. So the next question I've asked myself is how? I mean, what is happening? What is happening in discussions of food? What is happening in the food world to convince the vast majority of consumers who, who have chosen sort of new welfareism over veganism? Um, what is happening to convince them that, that is, that's an okay choice? I mean, what is happening to convince people um, not to directly address the question, the moral question, the ethical question of slaughter, which is the end result in both systems. What's keeping us from going there? And I think there are these structural forces in place that are very much keeping us from asking that very essential question. Is there something morally wrong to raise a sentient being, a being that um, experiences emotion, that experiences pain, that can anticipate pain? Is there something morally wrong with raising that animal killing it and eating it when we don't need to, irrespective of the way it's raised. Why are we not asking that question? Okay, a few things come to mind. One is the uh, media. Food writing, foodie journalism is not, it's not journalism. It's, it's advocacy, it's advertising. Um, I, you know, I, I really find it very frustrating that, that in general, most of the journalists and most of the journalism that that I read, high-end journalism, is, is um, tremendously thorough. And, and the, the vast majority of journalists that I know are um, incredibly critical. Um, I don't want to read another article about backyard chickens, you know. <laughs> I'm just tired of it. And, and I don't want to read articles about somebody who, you know, the stockbroker in New York who wants to go back to the land and um, kill ducks for a living. I, you know, these, these scenarios are presented in uh, a very kind of glorified way in, in, in general in the high-end mainstream media. And, and I often wonder, like, what would food writing be like if we could just take war correspondence, you know, and have them cover the food world? You know, they'd go right to the slaughter. Um, and we would start looking at things uh, differently. And, and, you know, why is this? I mean, it's easy to criticize. Journalists, but I mean, I think you know who are who are not writing the kind of articles that I would like to see written, or at least engaging. I mean, look, I mean, this is this is the food world, and and, and nothing is more fundamental to it, at least when it comes to meat and, and meat-based products. Nothing is more fundamental to it than trans um, than than um, transforming these live animals into flesh that we eat. So why are we not going there and writing about that? Um, and I think there are reasons for this. I think a lot of these, these writers are, are, are dependent on an audience of, and the thing is, the funny thing is, like a lot of these writers are the ones who have done a remarkable job of saying, look how horrible factory farming is. And they're the ones that have opened our eyes to that reality. But instead of taking the next step and asking some serious questions about the ethics of killing animals, they've instead glorified these alternative systems, these sort of new welfareist systems. It convinces us that there can be happy meat. And I think from a, as a journalist, it's like, well, that's what people want. I mean, really, uh, you get a lot of praise for writing those kind of articles. The feedback you get is remarkably positive, and that feels good. I mean, as somebody who gets, like, probably the overwhelming majority of the responses I get to my articles are negative. Um, and, you know, often violently <laughs> negative. I can see, I can understand the appeal of wanting to write in a way that, you know, encourages a, a, a praise. So I think that that has something to do with it. And I also think a lot of it has to do with, you know, I think a lot of journalists sort of might like the underdog. And a lot of these small farms, these small struggling farms kind of present themselves as taking on, you know, it's a kind of David Goliath story. And they want to they wanna side with David. And so I think there's that as well. I don't know. I mean, we could go on and on, but, but the bottom line is the vast majority of food writing is, um, you know, it's advocacy. It's, 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 it's advertising for um, these alternative systems that I don't think are ultimately in any way going to um, lead us towards true vegan education. Um, now, I, I feel compelled, more than compelled, uh, to say at this point that, you know, 
I have been writing um, fairly strong vegan advocacy articles uh, for The Atlantic now for over a year and a half. And so what this means is if you don't subscribe to The Atlantic, you need to because they're <laughs> the only uh, serious source of journalism that is uh, actually engaging articles on the ethics of slaughter. Um, so, and if you do subscribe, you know, up your subscription because I give them all the credit uh, in the world for, um, for allowing me to address these issues. I mean, I have to tell you, like, I write these articles and I think to myself, no, this one's going to get sent back. I know it. And, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. And they run it. And I, I, give, them, uh, I give them great credit for that. The other, I think, the other sort of structural aspect of the food world that, that keeps us from addressing new welfareism in, in terms of the ethics of slaughter, which is, I think, where we need to go and really think seriously about, um, is, is um, the, the, the people who, who own these farms themselves and the marketing strategies that they use. And I um, was at a conference in Boston last March, and it was a food journalism conference, and there was a very prominent uh, speaker there who who uh, owned a uh, a label that contracted out with several um, farms that were supposed to practice these very um, strict methods of, of of welfare with their animals. <laughs> do you, do you want me to leave now? <laughs> Is it my time to go? Um, and she. You know, she got up. I mean, this this is her business, and and she got up and gave a presentation, um, essentially designed to show how happy the animals were. And if you had walked in in the middle of this presentation, you would have thought maybe J. Crew is coming out with a new line of clothing, like an agricultural themed clothing. It was just it was pastoral pornography, is what it was. It was it was people dressed up very nicely, you know, with it, it, green grassy fields, blue skies, hugging animals, families out in fields, animals frolicking around, and it was pure propaganda. But that works. It works extremely well with consumers who are looking to connect with a set of values. That, 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 that suggests these animals are in fact happy and that, and that by supporting this kind, of, this kind of product, I am supporting the kind of scene that I'm seeing here. I mean, this, this is how propaganda works. And um, I think there's something particularly insidious about this agricultural propaganda because we as a society are so urbanized, we're so detached from nature that anything that suggests a connection to it, we, we tend to feel a very strong connection uh, to. So these marketers are extremely good about presenting their products to consumers as, um, you know, as essentially a, a, a moral good. This is something you should buy because you're going to support a set of, a set of positive values. You know, the whole time I was watching this presentation, I was just like one picture, one picture of, of what happens to these animals at the end. I mean, what, 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 these, what these advertisements are not telling you is that when the, when the, when the local restaurant guy shows up and says, I, you know, this, this is the pig I'm going to serve tonight, well, then, then, then it's over for these happy animals. I mean, that's, that's obvious, right? I mean, I shouldn't even have to say this, but it's, it's, it's not what's advertised. It's not what we think about as consumers. And the media, complicity, the media complicity means that this is not what we're thinking about. We're not thinking about the full cycle of what happens on these on these happy animal farms. And the final kind of structural um, aspect of the food world that keeps us from addressing these questions, in addition to the media and, and the marketers, um, involves uh, our, and this is really the topic of my book, um, it involves the kind of popular obsession with localism. And, and, and localism itself has achieved such cachet. Um, it, has, it has achieved such um, ideological significance on a, on a wide number of levels that it's almost as if, as if the product is local, well then we can stop thinking about it right now because it's local and that means that it's good. So the idea of locally sourced eggs or cheese or meat is, carries a kind of um, inherent worth. It has a kind of inherently positive connotation because we're so tired of globalization, we're t so tired of being distanced from the way that our food is produced, and all these are extremely good points. That we want connectivity, we want to It's as if, as long as I know the person, as long as I know the person who killed the animal that I'm about to eat, well, then it's okay, then it's okay. In other words, we're, we're just looking at this, we're so accustomed to looking at 
the behavior, this, this, this ingrained behavior of eating meat from a human perspective, that, that we can very much convince ourselves that if I know the farmer who, who raised this pig and then slaughtered it, well then this bacon is okay, it's, it's fine. I don't need to think about it, I don't need to ask any questions about it, I've done the right thing. Again, uh, this was the day after I had to endure this presentation of the uh, J. Crew Agriculture Happy Farm ad. I came to New York and get, was on a panel at the City of the Museum of New York. And two of the people I was on the panel with, this is where I met Jasmine and Marianne. They came up afterwards and gave me a bag. <laughs> and the two of the people on the panel, one was a, a woman who raised uh, 600 pigs a year on a farm in upstate New York. Um, and she sold all of her, her, her pigs to local restaurants, most of them here in, in Manhattan. And the other person on the um, panel was a fairly well-noted restaurateur here in New York. He owns a couple of restaurants that are known uh, for support, supporting uh, local farms and, and contracting with local farms. And, you know, this restaurateur gets up in the morning, you know, crack of dawn, even earlier, and goes up to the farm, and the, 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 the two of them were talking on the stage, and it was clear that there was a personal connection, and it was, um, it was clear that this, this, you know, this restaurateur was buying his, his pork from this farm, and that just really kind of with the audience just overwhelmed them, as you could see just little waves of joy rolling through the audience <laughs> as they were having this discussion, and that's where it really hit me that, God, this, I, this localism idea, I mean, this, I, I didn't have any idea of the extent of its of its ability to distort the way we think about basic moral questions when I wrote my book. But it really hit me when I was standing up there thinking, well, okay, so, so we're in a situation, we're in a room of highly intelligent people, and they're talking about the personal connection. And what's being obscured is, is what's happening to this pig. So, so, so Mr. Restaurant Guy shows up, and all the happiness ends for the pig um, it, it because, because there's a demand for pork bellies. You know, that's very popular right now. And that, you know, so I bring it up and people are like, oh, somebody's got to ruin the, ruin the mood here. We're feeling good. But it just doesn't, it, what, what, what people latch onto, what consumers latch onto is that personal connection between, between the, the, the farmer and the restaurant guy rather than, rather than what's happening to the, to the animal. And I think that has to do with this kind of irrational appeal of, of localism and, and the not irrational, I should say, desire on the part of consumers to, to have some kind of connectivity with the food that they're eating. All right, so the only hope that, that I really see, and this is really kind of a perverse sort of hope, but the only hope that I see in terms of our ability to see through these structural problems uh, has to do with the growing popularity of these new welfare systems, these, these um, alternative ways of producing meat. Um, this isn't really good news, but I think, you know, as they become more popular, and they are, I mean, they are becoming more popular. Um, right now, these alternative systems provide about 1% of the meat that we eat, which is exactly why we don't hear about many of the problems associated with these farms. Basic economics dictates this. As these farms become more popular, right? we live in a capitalist society where you have producers meeting demand for consumers. As competition increases, as demand increases, as these farms proliferate, even if they stay small, as they proliferate, I don't think it's possible, I don't think there's a, the land for it, I'll get to that in a little bit, but let's say they did, let's say they went to 10% and then 20%. Well, it's inevitable that when you have people who own animals to kill them and sell them to make a living, that they're going to cut corners. They're going to take shortcuts. That's just, it's an, it's, it's an ironclad law. It's an ironclad human law. It's an ironclad economic law. And so that's what I, I mean, really mark my words if you want. I mean, that's what I think we're going to see in, in 10 years. I don't think we're going to see a mass awakening where people say, oh yeah, well now I suddenly want to contemplate the ethics of slaughter. No, I think what you're going to see is these small alternative systems grow a little bit but proliferate and compete and cut corners and suddenly you're going to be back on that path towards factory farming. And so all these food writers are going to say, wow, okay, so I really advocated for these things but now look, look at what has happened to them and one can only hope 
maybe at that point, and this is why vegan education is so important, we have to stay on the scene because we're losing the battle now, but the issue is going to come up again. 10, 20 years from now, who knows? But we're going to have another crossroads, and it's going to involve these, these smaller farms. So there's sexism, and there's homophobia, and there's all xenophobia. There's all these problems in the human world. I mean, shouldn't we focus on those first, right? I mean, shouldn't we address those issues now? And then, and then you know, we won't worry about the animals after that. Or maybe we won't, we won't at all. We'll be so happy we won't even think about the animals, right? But, you know, what, how, do we wanna, how do we wanna do that? You know, I get that a lot. It's like, you, you, you spend so much time worried, worried, about, worried about animals. What about people? And it's like, well, I have two immediate reactions to that. Um, one is, I have a very difficult time envisioning a society where you were able to have a strong moral fabric that did not have prejudice or at least had significantly reduced prejudice of any sort while at the same time you were, you were tacitly uh, turning a blind eye to the killing of billions of animals. I just have a hard time reconciling that. and. Um, I don't know, I probably shouldn't use this analogy because it can often get taken, um, misinterpreted, but I'll use it anyway. Um, you know, the thing, because it's what I thought of. I mean, it is what I thought of as I was thinking about this argument. I mean, it would be like, you know, a concentration camp where the, 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 those who ran the concentration camp, you know, sort of got together for a meeting and said, well, I, I really think we need to create, you know, a better work environment here. And I think, you know, we really need to work on eliminating, you know, um, sexism here and have some equality. I, I mean, I know that's, that, that, that can be, but you see my point. I mean, that, 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 that it, the two don't, don't work together. And I think it's true. I mean, I don't think we can pursue very seriously a, a, a sound and a truly moral environment that's free of prejudice when we're engaging in the worst kind of speciesism. And, that, and that's, that's my second point, which is that you can't, um, it assumes that prejudices are fragmented, right? I mean, that, that okay, we're gonna deal with sexism, we're gonna deal with racism, we're gonna deal with homophobia, and then we're gonna deal with speciesism. But they're all connected. And so it does not, to me anyway, it's illogical to say I'm going to forget about animals for a minute and focus on these, these, these problems that we're experiencing in the human world um, with these prejudices. And we're gonna deal with those one at a time and then we'll get to the animals. The problem there is that just by making that decision, you're, you're engaging in speciesism to then, to then solve these other prejudices. And that's illogical to me. I don't think that works. And it assumes that the problems of prejudice are fragmented. But the problems of prejudice are not fragmented. Again, I'm not an, I'm not an ethicist. I'm just using common sense. And what common sense tells me is that prejudice is one thing. And, and, and overcoming it involves a change of heart. A change of heart that embraces tolerance, a change of heart that embraces a love of diversity, um, the ability to feel empathy for somebody different or something different from you, and, and, and compassion. I mean, it's just those things, those basic things. Um, um, opening your heart to compassion, to empathy, and to tolerance. And as I think about our relationship to the animal world, I feel very strongly that an individual who is able to open their heart to a non-human animal who is able to recognize that that animal has moral worth and, 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 and should be more than tolerated, but should be respected as an animal with moral worth. Somebody who's able to expand their circle of compassion to include a non-human animal, I have a very hard time believing that an individual capable of doing that could then walk out into the human world and engage in systematic racism or, or, or sexism or homophobia. So I think these are all connected, these prejudices, but I think, and, I, and again, I, you know, this is common sense. This is just uh, uh, my belief that if you address the issue on that level that I just mentioned, the human-animal relationship, well, then the compassion will trickle up. And um, if things can trickle up, I don't know if they can <laughs> trickle up, but uh, you can a better term. But, um, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, what, what is, I think, often keeping us from, from going with that emotion, I mean, every, you, I, honestly, I think you would have to be a psychopath not to look into the eyes of an animal and feel something. I mean, to have never had that experience. You really would have to be so distanced from your emotions to be a psychopath. 
So if people do see, do feel something when they look into an animal, it's often dismissed as anthropomorphism. Oh, you can't do that. Well, you can do that. And, and I think that's actually where, 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 where solving these other problems perhaps may start. So I do think that veganism has real potential to strengthen the moral fabric of our society as well. Veganism is an intellectual movement as well. And I think this is one area, and I am by no means an expert on veganism or the history of veganism or what other people have said about veganism. I'm relatively new to this way of, of, of thinking. Um, but my sense is that there needs to be more of an effort to embrace veganism as, as an intellectual movement uh, as well. And there's a great opportunity to do this because I think veganism's deepest roots are actually in Darwinism. Um, you know, there's not an enlightened person who believes, you know, there, there's not an enlightened person who doesn't understand that we share um, an evolutionary history with, of course, non-human animals. Um, this is sort of basic evolutionary biology, and, and basic evolutionary biology tells us that we have, we share a physical, okay, it tells us that we share a physical, first it tells us we share a physical history with the non-human animal world. In other words, you know, I can look at a, um, you know, my skeleton of my arm. I can look at the bones of my arm and I can see a dim reflection in the fins of a fish. I mean, this is sort of high school biology, except in Texas in some places. But, <laughs> but you know, this is a sort of basic tenet of enlightened thought. Um, most people are fine with this. Most people are going to just be perfectly secure with this basic physical, the physical uh, aspect of evolutionary biology. Um, it's in the fossil record, it's, it's in our DNA. It's very little to argue with there. Now, it's important to note here that a lot of conscientious, you know, so-called conscientious, conscientious carnivores fully understand that. Obviously, they fully, fully are on board with this idea of, of, of our physical connection to the, to the non-human animal world. No problem there. No disagreement there. And, and, you know, the fact of the matter is that's fine. It makes sense. I mean, if we're just looking at Darwinism in terms of physical evolution, in terms of, of, of morphological evolution, if we're just looking at it in those terms, there really is no room for any sort of moral discussion because as, a, as, a, as a, in terms of physical connectivity, the lion who kills you know, me on the tundra, um, that's the same event as me killing the lion, right, and turning it into a rug. I mean, as, as, in terms of physical evolution, the, 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 the story of physical evolution has no say whatsoever on those two events. They're no different. They're morally neutral, okay? And, and, you know, the fact of the matter is just physical Darwinism actually says nothing. It gives no reason whatsoever for, uh, to, for me to question the problem of going out and killing an animal and eating it. Physical Darwinism doesn't at all. In fact, I mean, in a lot of the responses that I get to my articles in The Atlantic, people are like, we've evolved to kill animals. We should go out and kill animals. We're meant by evolution to go kill animals. You've heard this, right? It's natural. And that's what they're doing. What they're doing is they're just looking at Darwinism in terms of physical evolution and our shared physical heritage. But there's another side to Darwinism, and this is um, obviously more difficult to, um, to verify in terms of the fossil record, and in some cases in terms of the genetic record. But it's not just, Darwin is not just about physical evolution. As we're learning from animal ethologists, it's much newer science, but Darwinism is also about the evolution of consciousness. It's about the evolution of emotions. It's about the evolution of, and all that entails, such as the ability to experience suffering and distress, um, the ability to, to feel pain and fear pain, um, the ability to have an identity, or to identify with a social group, or identify with a family. All of these things that we can all relate to, according to um, the vast majority of evolutionary biologists, has, has uh, connectivity to the non-human animal world. In other words, just like the parallel of my arm to the fin, my emotion, the fear that I might experience when I'm threatened, also has its counterpart. Different, 
dimmer, perhaps harder to understand, but it has its counterpart in the animal world. My ability to feel affection for a social group has its counterpart in the animal world. This is why anthropomorphism is so important. And when people tell you not to anthropomorphize, you should say, I want to, because I'm, I'm trying to understand my, genetic, my uh, evolutionary heritage. Um, so other scientists have said this much better than I, than I have. But I hope you get at least the general point I'm making, because this changes the moral equation. I'm going to read you two quotes from two famous scientists, just because they do say it better. But the, uh, this changes the moral equation. I mean, if it's not just a, a neutral, morally neutral, physical heritage that I share with the non-human animal world. Now it's, it's consciousness. It's feeling. It's all the things that come under our, our, our moral purview and that justify including something, someone, some animal, in, in, in our circle of moral compassion. If, if, if the animal I'm going to kill just has nothing more than physical connectivity to me, I have no problem killing it. If it shares, if it has a history of consciousness that I share with it, well, that's different. Boy, that makes me sort of put the gun away and think. Um, that, by the way, that point that I just made about, about how evolution is also about the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of mentality, the evolution of feeling and emotion, that's, as I see it, where vegans have an opportunity to justify their belief system in modern science. It's something that a meat eater cannot do. And it, it's empowering, I think, to have that in your, in your um, kind of toolbox of arguments. Uh, Donald Griffin, who you may have read, he's sort of the father of cognitive ethology, which is the science of animal thought. He wrote a great book, he wrote several books, but one of them is called Animal Minds. Um, he was a longtime Harvard professor of psychology, and I think a real renegade and hero for actually addressing uh, this, this, this question of, of you know, evolution, including emotions. Um, because, you know, it's not like there's a fossil record out there. You can't go to a fossil and say, well, there's the emotional, you know, there's the emotional con contact I was looking at. It's not in the fossil record. It's harder to do. Here's what he writes, and this is, in, I think, the most cogent way I've seen this idea expressed. And again, I really want to stress that this, this, this is what I think vegans really need to, to ground themselves intellectually in. He writes, the central nervous system of multicellular animals all operate by means of the same basic processes, regardless of the species or even the phylum in which they are found. Because we know that at least one species, us, does indulge in conscious thinking and take it for granted that conscious and unconscious thinking result from activities of the central nervous system, we have no solid basis for excluding a priori the possibility that conscious thinking takes place in any animal with a reasonably well-organized central nervous system. To me, that idea changes everything. I mean, it, it demands that we include animals in our circle of moral compassion and give them due consideration. No, one more quote, um, just to look at it from a slightly different angle. This is from Bernard Rollin, who's, you may know, the leading authority on veterinary ethics. Um, he echoes this theme in his book, Animal Rights and Human Morality. Uh, quote, for Darwin himself and for the 19th century biologists, at least in England and America, who carried forth his ideas, uh, thought and feeling in animals was an, an inevitable consequence of phylogenic continuity. If morphological and physiological traits are evolutionarily continuous, so too are psychological ones. And he calls this idea the foundational theory of modern biology. So Rollin is including in the foundational theory of modern biology this continuity, not just of physiological traits, but of um, psychological ones as well. And again, I think this is a fuller understanding of Darwinism, and it's one that vegans need to embrace to distinguish themselves uh, and to justify what they're doing on an intellectual and scientific basis. Let me just read uh, a kind of version of my summation of what this all means. In essence, we are not emotionally or cognit cognitively distinct in any fundamental way from non-human animals. This single fact may be the best objective intellectual justification we can come up with for veganism. When humans and non-human animals are part of a continuum, 
Rather than thought of as qualita qualitatively distinct forms of life, human meat eaters confront a serious quandary. It becomes incumbent upon us to forge a contemporary justification for carnivorous behavior. Aristotle and Genesis will no longer do. And by the way, that is what meat eaters are left with. Okay? If they take a full embrace of Darwinism, they have, to they have to reject part of it and justify their behavior on an Aristotelian view of the world or, or, or a biblical view of the world with, which said that humans are, are, are not only distinctly are not only distinct from non-human animals, but they're superior to them, and, and, and even more so that the animals were put there for human use. I mean, Darwin blew that idea out of the water. Aristotle and Genesis will no longer do. By undermining the long-held basis of inherent human superiority over non-human animals, the science of evolution obliterated the framework within which thoughtful carnivores long justified their behavior. As it now stands, human meat-eaters, unless they reject modern science, support the killing of non-human animals without the slightest intellectual or ethical grounding. And I think that gives, that gives vegans power. And, and that's my fourth point, is that veganism ultimately, I mean, no matter how we, we, we split hairs and no matter what kind of internal disagreements there are within the vegan establishment or people who are pursuing veganism, it's ultimately empowering. And in the course of writing my book, uh, Just Food, and writing the articles that I've written having to do with food and agriculture, one thing I hear over and over again from people is, well, these problems are so huge. You know, I mean, industrial agriculture has taken over the world, and big pharma has taken over the world, and, and we have this political system that's, that's you know, uh, corrupted by subsidies, and what can I possibly do? You know, I mean, is there any way that can have any impact whatsoever? to uh, address these problems. And you know, I think this is why localism has had so much appeal, because people feel like, I need something to grab onto. I need something tangible. But you know, again, as I hope I've shown here, localism really just is, is a good thing going to recreate the same problems. Um, and I find it much more empowering to advocate veganism, because it addresses all of these issues directly. I mean, you can take any problem, any problem with agriculture. It's not the scale of agriculture that's the problem. I mean, we like to think that, but it's not the scale that's the problem. It's the fact that it's so centered on meat production. I mean, any problem, uh, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, um, fertilizer runoff, um, what have you. You're going to find, and you trace the problem, you're going to find meat at the end of it. So I think it's important to stress that. And Believe me, I, as I go over these four points and I talk about sort of empowerment and intellectual grounding and, and the health benefits and, and how there really is no such thing as cruelty-free meat, and as I develop these tenants, you know, I, I also just recently took a 3,000-mile drive across country, and you sort of go, why am I even bothering? You know, it's like one fast food restaurant after, after another, and you know, you're on the road trying to eat something that's not going to kill you, and it's hard to do that. And you're just reminded over and over again in these very small ways that I am, um, I don't know, if not tilting at windmills, like I don't know what the, par par the, the metaphor would be, but you know, it is this is this making any difference whatsoever? Then you have conversations with people like I did just yesterday as I was kind of putting this talk together and this uh, woman uh, in the area where I'm staying in Connecticut was out working in her yard and I fell into a conversation with her and I was wearing another shirt um, that said herbivore on it and she's like, are you a vegetarian? And, uh, <laughs> but actually it turned out that uh, she, you know, she, was, she was a vegan like for 20 years. And I thought, well, that's remarkable. We need to stick together. And she, but the, she, she said something that really just made my heart sink, which was um, just in the course of normal conversation, she said, you know, I've been doing this for you know, decades, and I don't think I've changed one mind. You know, and she said that. And so, you know, the, you, have the, you have these recurring stories that really make you feel um, discouraged, to, to say the least. As I was actually leaving to go to the train today, the neighbor next door ran out and said, we're having a lobster roast tomorrow. How many do you want? And I was like, <laughs> Gotta get the train, you know. So, I mean, I know that, that, that if, you, if you are a vegan, you experience that hourly, you know. I mean, not even daily, but, but hourly. So, I mean, my, my, my way of dealing with that, and again, uh, you know, empowerment, is to remind myself how empowering this is personally, and, 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 and it has political reverberations as well. But I also try to see hope in every situation. And so I'll just end with this anecdote because it really just stuck with me. I saw this, uh, I was in Gloucester, Massachusetts, I guess about a month ago. And I was uh, actually in this, in this uh, park near where the, um, 
the, the fishing boats came in, and uh, usually the guys, you know, come in on these fishing boats, and they, they, they haul the catch right to this warehouse there where it's frozen, and, you know, legal seafood comes in and buys it and serves it in restaurants. Um, and so this guy came in and, on, on a small boat, and he got off of it, and his family was waiting for him, and the family had a, had a dog. And this, this, this guy um, still had on all his fishing gear, and, you know, he, he'd been out, you know, killing fish. And, and then, it, to make matters even sort of more poignant, he, he took off his straps and he had this, like, T-shirt about, like, barbecue. It was, like, for a barbecue restaurant or something like that, you know? And, so, and then, then he, um, he saw his dog. It's like he hardly paid attention to his kids, but he, like, ran right to his dog. And, and was, was this big, big sort of macho fisher, fisherman was just on the ground hugging his dog. The dog was looking at his face, and I just thought, two dots, and they need to be connected, and maybe that guy can change. So that's how I think. That's the only way I can get through, uh, through this. Thanks very much.